Hi, and welcome back to the channel. Yes, I've got these glasses on for a reason. And it's messing with my head to have them on with the bright light in here and uh, looking at the camera. So what I'm going to do is change to the old one. William Castle was an interesting character. He was a showman as much as he was a movie maker. He started out with Columbia Pictures in the publicity department and did a bunch of forgettable movies and then started making these kind of independent projects still distributed by Columbia on a fairly low budget in the 1950s. And Columbia did some interesting genre things. They did Curse of the Undead, of course, the vampire gunslinger movie with Michael Pate. A whole bunch of stuff. If you look through Columbia's uh, filmography for the 50s, you're going to find some quirky and interesting slow budget horror movies and a little bit of science fiction as well. There's... Uh, that really nice depth of interesting films there. So William Castle mortgaged his house in about 1957 and made a movie called Macabre, which is really cool. And then he made The Tingler, and that's the one that people remember because The Tingler had Percepto as a gimmick. What Castle did was this. He got a whole bunch of military surplus windscreen de-ices for aeroplanes and the de-ices had vibrating motors so he had somebody wire them up to the bottom of chairs and when the creepy bits of the tingler come along the seats would vibrate and people would get shocked these days probably couldn't do that because people might mistake it for some kind of involuntary sex toy nonetheless it worked as a gimmick at the time and people enjoyed it because it made movies more tangible and more perceptible by doing this, even though the Tingler itself is, is very much a big picture. And Vincent Price is pretty good in it. Uh, he hadn't quite got to that stage of his career where he's camping it up a lot. And he's playing this one dead straight. He plays a scientist called Warren Chapin, who is investigating fear. He's also a pathologist, and he does the autopsies for people who are executed in the electric chair and found out that one guy had a whole bunch of his spinal vertebrae shattered and that there was no pathological reason why that should happen. This leads him down the path of investigating and finding out that in extreme circumstances and extreme fear, there's a microscopic organism in the base of your spine called a tingler, which grows to about 60 centimeters long and grabs your spine and basically breaks your spine unless you scream. Now, we know that's not the case because if it was, somebody would have militarized it by now. But it's a nice little conceit and it's a really creepy looking centipede thing, which you can see the wires when they manipulate it, but that doesn't really matter because it's that kind of movie where you just go with that kind of stuff. Warren meets a guy called Ollie, who uh, runs a silent movie cinema with his wife. Meanwhile, his wife is going out with pretty much anybody who asks her. His sister-in-law wants to marry Daryl Hickman's character, who is the pathology assistant to Warren. And so there are some complications there and things get very, very toxic in Warren's relationship with his wife. He gets to do an x-ray of the tingler and finds out that it actually exists. Then Ollie's wife, who is what they used to call a deaf mute, dies of fright. And the tingler inside her doesn't get dissolved by the screaming. And there's a really nice scene in the pathology lab where Warren is doing the autopsy. And you see it in silhouette because it's 1958, 59. You really couldn't show somebody slicing up in a woman's spine and pulling out a giant bug. But you can show it in silhouette. And that's something that William Castle learned from working in Columbia. You can suggest, you can show shadows and people's minds will make up the difference. So Warren has himself a live tingler, but before that, and I've jumped ahead a bit, before that, Warren decides he's gonna scare himself so he can feel what a tingler feels like. And to do that for the very first time, but not the last in cinema history, a character takes LSD. Warren doses himself with the correct dose, injects it into himself, and has a bad acid trip he experiences the tingler, but he can't not scream, so he screams and the tingler dissolves. It's kind of cool that this is the first time LSD is being used in the movie. And based on something um, a friend told me, bad acid trips can be a very nasty thing and they are totally believable while you're in the moment of them. Don't ask me how I know. 
But if it's good enough for Vincent Price, it's good enough for me. Don't do drugs, kids. So does the Tingler work as a movie in the 21st century? Yeah, it does. It doesn't work as a scary movie particularly because we're desensitized to this kind of scare to a great extent. But it works as an entertainment and the conceit of there being something inside human spines which can tear their spines out if they get too scared is a really cool one. The movie Like 13 Ghosts has an introduction by William Castle because he was trying to Hitchcock himself up a bit and make himself part of the movie and to kind of become a director producer who was name value and to a certain extent he did that. He also wrote an autobiography which I've got a copy of in the other room which is a lot of fun for you to read. The truthfulness of it may be a little bit in question. There is a little bit of him kind of exaggerating in that autobiography but it's a very amusing read if you get a chance to do so. And because of that wonderful conceit that we have of the tingler the movie has gained a cult status. I believe there has been a reissued version of it where the wires moving the tingler have been digitally removed and I'm in favour of that. The wires aren't any intrinsic part of the movie that you want to keep and removing them just adds a little bit of kind of reality that wasn't there otherwise. But I suppose people were kind of used to that in the 1950s and 60s and even into the 1970s. In certain kinds of movies you couldn't remove the wires so people just kind of pretended not to see them. But the tingle works. Vincent Price is good as always. He was always a consummate professional. And his Warren Chapin with his um, unfaithful wife played by Patricia Cutts is very good. Daryl Hickman playing his assistant is really good. Daryl Hickman was, if you might remember, in the 1940s the kid with polio that Gene Tierney lets drown in Leave It to Heaven. He grew up, he became a jobbing actor, and he um, made a career of it. He's also Dobie Gillis's brother. Dwayne Hickman, his brother, played Dobie Gillis in the TV series back in the 1950s, for those of you who can remember. Revisiting the Tingler was a lot of fun. Uh, it's a very much a kind of sit down with the popcorn and a beer kind of movie. It has that conceit of William Castle being at the front and that conceit of having a centipede inside your spine, which is something you don't really want to think about too much when you're sleepy. But it works. It's entertaining. It's fun. It's got an acid trip in it. And it has a monster that you really appreciate. The most valuable character in the movie, apart from Vincent Price, is Judith Evelyn, playing Mrs. Higgins, the deaf mute woman whose husband runs a silent cinema with her. And she is really good. She committed to the role. Playing a woman who has certain phobias, she does seem to have an obsessive compulsive disorder and also a blood phobia, which is something that uh, Rob White, the writer, didn't really think through because if you think about it, the people I've known who are scared of blood have for the most part been guys for a very specific anatomical reason. I remember going to a blood bank once and there was a macho guy came in he started flirting with all of the nurses. He was smiling and chuckling and having a great time. And then they stuck the needle in him and they had to put him on oxygen. So guys are the ones who have blood phobias. Women are less likely to for certain reasons. But the Tinklers are recommended. If you haven't got it in your collection, you should have it. I have the 40th anniversary edition of it, which is the DVD one. It's not the Blu-ray. But it's got a good cover there with Vincent Price and the Tingler on the, on the cover. It has a few special features. It's got a bit of uh, a documentary about it. It's got an interview with Daryl Hickman and a few other little bits and pieces in there, including a specific bit in the movie, which was made for drive-ins rather than theatres, where Vincent Price calls out for people in the audience to scream so the Tingler won't get them, because the Tingler does get into the silent movie cinema. Uh, so this one's a pretty honest copy of it. I'm not adverse to getting a Blu-ray edition if I think about it and I can save up my pennies and you know take some bottles back to the shop for deposit refunds and get some money to do that. But at this stage, I'm kind of happy with this one. It's got pretty much all the extras you need and it's a very crisp transfer. That takes us on to 13 Ghosts, which has been remade quite badly, as I recall. But I got 13 Ghosts in a five-movie 
William Castle pack, which has 13 ghosts, 13 frightened girls, Mr. Sardonicus, Homicidal, and the Old Dark House. And it's quite good. Uh, I don't think it's a particularly great transfer of 13 ghosts. So there's a little bit of pixelation on a fine detail line uh, with this one. So I may well try to pick up a decent copy of it. But 13 Ghosts is a nice movie. It's got another William Castle introduction, just like The Tingler has, where he um, talks about ghosts and he has a skeleton for a secretary and, and that kind of conceit. Again, that's him pushing his brand very much. In this one, a, a nice family, a father and mother and two kids, inherit a haunted house from an uncle called Plato Zorba. And the father of the family, Sai, is kind of broke most of the time. He, he's trying to raise a family, you know, he's trying to raise two kids on a fairly low budget as a museum something or other, as a paleontologist, I think it is, at the museum. His boss is played by John Van Drillen, who's supposed to be a scary guy in most of the movies I've seen him in, at least. But in this one, is a fairly benign character. There are a couple of problems with the house. First one is, the housekeeper is played by Margaret Hamilton, who played the witch in Wizard of Oz, and has a lot of fun in this one. It turns out to be a benign character called Elaine, who is a psychic medium. She's a lot of fun in the movie and plays it very straight, and uh, it's great to just see her in the film. Uh, there's also a lawyer called, played by Martin Milner, who's interested in the daughter of the family, who is of age. And there's another gift that the uncle has left size of, which is a pair of funky spectacles which enable him to see ghosts. That is where Illusiono comes in. And rather than using the Illusiono glasses, I had these, which are my red blue 3D glasses that I picked up on eBay a few years ago. Now to see the ghosts, you look through the red lens. To not see the ghosts, you look through the blue lens. And so I just watched parts of this movie where it says, hold up your viewer through the red lens with one eye shut. I could watch it with both eyes, but it got a bit confusing there. So if you've got a pair of these, you can watch this movie. That looks really cool when I do that. The son of the family, Buck, is very much into ghosts. He's already kind of pre-positioned for being in this movie. He's a fan of ghosts. He likes sliding down banisters. And he's not particularly perturbed when the ghosts show up. And the lovely way that William Castle gives us the ghosts is by having a coloured screen with the ghosts in a certain colour that you can only see through one of the lenses. And it's a unique little gimmick that Illusiono, it's got a bad name, Illusiono is a shit name for it. But having a, um, a way of seeing the ghosts or not seeing the ghosts makes it a lot of fun. It makes it more interactive to just watch the movie, even at home. To be honest, you can see the ghosts if you don't wear any lenses at all, but I wanted to kind of have the full experience. So I went in and watched it with the red lens, of course, because I'm not a chicken. Plato Zorba's also left a lot of money hidden in the house for reasons that are never explained. But in this kind of movie, you don't necessarily need them explained to you. And the money is being sought by certain parties in the movie. And I won't do spoilers about that. So is it as entertaining as The Tingler? I think so in its own way. Uh, it's as entertaining as this one or House on Haunted Hill. It's got a few creep scares. It doesn't have any jump scares in it, but it's got those ones where something creepy happens at the edge of the screen. And it, it may well have been seen as a, a creepy movie in 1960 when it came out to audiences. Because again, we're kind of differently programmed to see different things as horrifying in movies. But it works as an entertainment. Uh, the characters are played by Donald Woods and Rosemary Van Camp. And... Uh, the, the family themselves are a bit bland and white bread in some ways, but they're supposed to be because they're not where the entertainment lies. The entertainment is in the ghost. There's a ghost of a lion. There's a ghost of the lion tamer who the lion bit the head off. There's a ghost of an Italian chef. There's a flaming ghost. The ghosts from all, from all around the world. And I think there's even a flaming mandala wheel from Tibet because Plato Zorba went around the world collecting ghosts and bringing them to his house. And so the ghosts are, in a sense, captured there, but also seem to be fairly okay with living in this creepy old house. 
And to be really honest with you, the ghosts aren't the threat in this movie. The ghosts are okay living there, and that kind of makes it a little bit different because in most movies, the ghosts either want to get to the afterlife or are so kind of damaged that they want to kill and, and drive people mad and all that kind of thing. But this movie takes a different approach where the ghosts are okay being where they are. And that makes it a little bit cooler than it would be otherwise because it subverts the expectations of a 1960 audience in a very nice way. And I kind of like that. I like movies that don't just tick the boxes when it comes to the nature of supernatural entities. So I like 13 Ghosts a lot. The new movie version of it, I remember nothing about, about it because it was one of those generic horror movies that came out around the turn of the century where people found old intellectual properties that people liked and then totally used them as toilet paper. So um, just to finalise on this, both of them are a good recommend from me. They're a good Saturday night movie, even if you haven't seen them before and they're brand new to you. Give them a go. You should be able to find them around quite easily. You can uh, rent them. You can buy them. I recommend physical media because it's physical media and you're not at the whim of an algorithm. And uh, we all know how many movies that you really like suddenly disappeared from your watch list before you got a chance to watch them. So just to finalise things, and I'll change back to the other glasses now. Get the jab. Watch some good movies. Watch some bad movies. Watch a few old William Castle movies and let me know if you want me to re review a few more because there are more out there. There's Macabre, there's Homicidal, there's Mr. Sardonicus, there's The Old Dark House, there's 13 Frightened Girls. There are a whole bunch of them which are entertaining above their budgets and their production values. And William Castle made them intensely watchable. I could kind of do without the William Castle introductions. They don't seem to add too much value for me. But I like the fact that he was out there pumping his product. And of course, William Castle was the inspiration for John Goodman's character in Joe Dante's Matinee, which is a fantastic movie as well. So anyway, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Check out a William Castle horror movie or two. And I'll catch you next time.